morning, everyone. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, and we are very pleased to welcome you all here this morning uh, and for this afternoon for, uh, once again, the Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Technology Expo and the Policy Forum. I hope that you will take full advantage of all of the exhibits right around the corner in the Rayburn foyer. And we are very pleased to be holding this event again this year uh, in conjunction with the House Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus, which is a bipartisan caucus. So let's get started. Uh, we have a number of panels today with a number of speakers. We want to make sure that we are able to hear from everybody. There is. Uh, an exciting array of information of technologies that I think it's really important for us all to know about and indeed to be excited about uh, at this time of great challenge in terms of energy and environmental issues facing this country. So to start us off this morning, we will first hear from, from Max Grunig, who is the president of the Ecologic Institute. Thank you. Thank you, Carol, for convening this uh, very important gathering of energy experts, but also policymakers and policymaker staff. It's really an important event, and I'm glad to be here again. And thank you for having me here as a guest, as a speaker. And good morning, everyone. Yeah, my name is Max Grunig from the Ecologic Institute. We are a nonprofit center for transatlantic sustainability here in Washington, D.C. You can hear already, I'm, I'm German, I live in the U.S., so the whole institute is very transatlantic. We focus a lot on Germany and Europe and, of course, the United States. And um, since our founding in 2008 already, which now seems like a lifetime ago, a very different world, um, we already focused on energy. So energy has always been a very important part of our programming, energy and climate. And our core program for discussing energy and the energy transition is the Energy Future Exchange. And that's also what brings me here today. The Energy Future Exchange, or short EFEX, is our core program that connects both Europe and the United States on questions of the energy transition. For us, there's two large questions or main questions that we want to address together. And the first one is, uh, what energy future do we want? And then the second one is, of course, once we settled on the first one, maybe, how do we get there? And so these are, of course, two very short questions, but complex questions. And I think today here, the expo and the forum is probably a very good question, uh, very good for addressing the first question, for talking about what energy future do we want, um, where do we want to go. And I think these are very helpful and very instrumental in that regard. But some things cannot be answered here in these halls, uh, as, as smart as the people here might be. So partly for that reason, and to address the second question, how do we get there? That's where our energy future change takes us to go outside in the field to explore and discover. And um, that's really the main motivation for our activities. We interact um, with thinkers, doers, policymakers, and of course people can be both, right? So it's not an uh, exclusive categories. And um, in the US and in Germany and in all of Europe, and of course beyond that even. Um, and I think I want to point out that there's so much happening, and there's so many people really leading the transition, and just people don't always know about them. And it's so important to connect them uh, across the Atlantic. So for us, when we talk about the energy transition, it's way more than just transitioning from one fuel to another, just doing the fuel switch. It's more about a profound paradigm shift. It's really about changing the way we do things, 
the way our economies work, the way our societies work. And that amount of change triggers a lot of concern or how we say in German, angst, yeah? So this is understandable. It's not an easy transition. Nobody says that. And um, to just illustrate the depth of transitions and how things can happen and also how you can succeed. So I grew up in West Berlin. And uh, when the wall came down, um, I was actually in bed because I was younger and it was past my bedtime. But the next morning I realized what had happened. Okay, so with some delay, but I realized something profound had happened. And nobody thought this. Even in the spring of 89, nobody thought the wall would be down by the end of the year. And this singular event, much celebrated, really only was the beginning only of this whole transition path. I mean, it wasn't over. Then you had to actually take out the checkbooks, and then you had to do the heavy lifting. And it was a tough transition, but people had a vision. They had the vision of the unified country, and they knew where they wanted to go. So they knew why they would be creating all these activities, why they would do this effort. And they succeeded. So it's, very, it's, a, it's a very nice example how you can get somewhere, even if it's a tough road, if you have a shared vision. And I hope in the energy world, the Energy Future Exchange can at least provide, contribute in a small degree to helping make this vision in the energy realm a reality. So starting last November, the Energy Future Exchange invited members of Congress and their staffers to explore how Germany is working to transition to a cleaner energy system. Um, and our first tour took us to three very large cities, to Hamburg, Munich, and Berlin. And these are cities where very often progress outpaces policy. So this is interesting in some ways. Now the second tour took us to a very different level of cities. We went to Frankfurt, the capital uh, of finance in Germany, um, which is also a bigger city, but we also went to the German Rust Belt, to the Ruhrgebiet or Ruhr area, which is an area where really very often um, the past can overwhelm progress. And that's an interesting counter uh, example. We visited very cutting edge uh, lab for fuel cell research. We test drove uh, electric ma mail uh, delivery trucks and uh, went to Energy Plus affordable housing in Frankfurt and saw a lot of uh, examples. We also visited the investment bank that actually funded a lot of these projects. Very important always to know where the money is coming from. But it's really not just about the products and processes, but very, very much about the people and connecting the people who are behind this, who are actually implementing this vision. So let's go back. We went to an open pit mine in the Ruhr area. Uh, it's a lignite mine in Garzweil and near Cologne. And the landscape, you can really imagine this, is very barren, no vegetation, just sand and lignite. And we heard a very compelling rational story from the owner and operator uh, of that mine, RWE, about the use of uh, the law of eminent domain to manage the land, how they would compensate with fair market value the owners of land, and how they would get better, more comfortable, and more quality homes in their new locations. And then that really made a lot of sense. Uh, we went by coincidence the next day to a different uh, research institute and met somebody whose parents w had been relocated in their 70s after they had lived their whole life in their homes and they had to leave the home where they had raised their children, where they had lived their lives. And this story was a very different story from the version from the owner operator. So it was very interesting to see these two examples Examples. I've been uh, given the kind of hint that we are uh, nearing the end of the time, but I wanted to say you have two examples to engage with us in life in this Energy Future Exchange. The very first one is now in September in Brussels. We have a conference uh, on the 
energy future in the heart of Europe, discussing with European civil society. And then later in November, there's another program from members of Congress and their staffers going to Germany, going to the north of Germany to study wind, offshore and onshore wind, and also power uh, or wind to hydrogen uh, facilities. And then in the second part of the program, we'll be in Berlin talking to Parliament and German uh, policymakers. So this will happen exactly before Thanksgiving. And you'll see that I uh, do have a booth out there. So I'll have these programs there. And also, if you go and talk to me, you can get this wonderful tote bag, uh, which is, of course, excellent for carrying all the documents you can gather here. So thank you very much. And I'll be happy to answer either questions if we have time later here or at the booth out there. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Max. And obviously, it's terribly important for us to learn from, from others. And we have often looked at, at lessons that we have learned from Germany, other European countries. And as this panel is, is really focused on public policy and sustainability, um, I think it's important to recognize how much we really depend upon our neighbors and our allies, which is why you're also going to hear from another one of the countries that is so important in terms of thinking about where we go on energy and environment. So let me introduce Andrew Daw, who is the first secretary for energy and environment with the Embassy of Canada. Andrew. Thank you very much, Carol, and thank you everyone for being here this morning. It's a real pleasure to be here and see uh, so many of you uh, interested in the Clean Energy Expo. Uh, as Carol said, I'm with the Canadian Embassy, and so I'm here to tell you this morning a little bit about Canada's uh, energy story. And this is a good story and one that's, we believe, important and significant to the United States. Because Canada and the U.S. have built one of the most integrated energy markets in the world. 74 oil and natural gas pipelines and 34 major electrical transmission lines transport energy back and forth across our borders each and every day. Canada also supplies virtually all the electricity and natural gas that's imported to the United States. One in 15 U.S. homes are powered by Canadian uranium. Canada provides the U.S with almost half of its crude oil imports, more than all the members of OPEC combined. So Canada will continue to be the best possible partner to the United States as you build a cleaner energy system that is affordable and secure. This is first and foremost because Canada is an energy powerhouse. We are the world's second largest producer of hydropower and of uranium. We are a top 10 producer of other renewable energies. We're also a global leader in the production of minerals essential to renewable energy technologies and batteries, such as nickel, cobalt, and graphite. Canada's leadership, however, is as much about the energy we produce as it is how we go about producing that energy and those energy minerals. Canada is committed to producing energy resources the right way. This means taking an inclusive approach to energy to the energy transition. People are at the center of our actions. A few years ago, Natural Resources Canada, our Department of Energy, conducted a public consultation on Canada's energy future that reached over 380,000 Canadians. This generation energy consultation led to four principles that guide decisions by the Canadian government to support Canadian families, businesses, and communities. These include saving energy, powering clean communities, using more renewable fuels, and helping power the world. An inclusive approach also means improving laws for how consultation and partnerships must happen when it comes to building energy projects in Canada. Respecting the rights of Indigenous people is, in, is essential to Canada, and the government is working with Indigenous peoples to find solutions that will lead to better social, economic, and environmental outcomes. Inclusive also means ensuring everyone can participate in the opportunities created by the energy sector. 
So along with Sweden and Italy, Canada is a founding member of the Clean Energy Education and Empowerment Initiative, or C3E. Recognizing that the transition to a clean energy future will only succeed if we harness all possible talent, C3E seeks to enable greater gender diversity in clean energy professions. So under C3E, Canada launched the Equal by 30 initiative to advance the participation of women in the clean energy sector and energy transition. To date, more than 110 organizations have signed on, including governments, companies, and trade associations around the world. Producing energy the right way also means addressing climate change. In Canada, we know that climate change is real and that human activity is a significant contributor. Canada is taking aggressive action through innovation, regulation, and policy. We're moving forward to transition our energy system and our emissions are coming down. We have a head start on this though because over 80% of Canada's electric electricity comes from sources that do not emit greenhouse gases. Because Canada and the US electricity systems are so highly integrated, trade with Canada represents a low cost way for northern states to meet their renewable energy targets. Projects like the Manitoba-Minnesota transmission line, approved by the Canadian government this June, will allow, allow Canadian hydro to act as a battery for U.S. intermittent renewables. When the wind is blowing, U.S. power flows north. When it stops, Canadian dams will open and keep the lights on down south. While Canadian, Canada's clean power system is a huge advantage, we recognize the need to do more. Canada and the U.K founded the Powering Past Coal Alliance that commits members to phase out unabated coal power generation. Five U.S. states have signed on as members of this alliance. For Canada's part, we've committed to phase out this unabated coal fire generation by 2030. Ontario has already completed this phase out in what has been the single largest emissions reduction effort in North America. The power sector is essential to the energy transition, but it is important to note that Canada's push for cleaner energy includes oil and gas. Canada is the only major source of U.S. energy imports that has imposed a carbon tax on carbon pollution. Canada and Alberta have brought in new regulations to cut methane emissions by 45% by 2025. And Alberta has imposed a cap on oil sands emissions of 100 megatons. No other country that supplies the U.S. with energy has a comparable basket of measures to drive down greenhouse gas emissions. And through innovation, per barrel GHG emissions in Canada's oil sands have fallen by a fifth over the last 10 years. And it is projected to fall another 16 to 23 percent over the next decade. Today this means that oil sands are in the same range as the other heavy oils consumed in the U.S and is in fact lower than many, such as California Thermal. So this progress in the oil sands is just one example of how innovation has become and continues to be at the core of Canada's energy sector. We're investing $2.3 billion in clean energy innovation, such as wind, solar, alternative fuels, energy efficiency, carbon capture, utilization, and storage, and on top of tens of billions of dollars in the green infrastructure. Canada is also supporting projects to reduce reliance on diesel and other fossil fuels in Canada's northern, rural, and remote communities, many of which are indigenous or have majority indigenous populations. These include supporting solar, PV installations with battery storage, wind, small-scale hydro, biomass-fueled heating systems, and building local school skills and capacity. These clean energy projects aim to improve energy security and sustainability while also positioning communities to own and operate their own energy assets. Canadian clean tech labs are, and startups are often working hand in hand with partners in the US to unlock new innovative energy solutions. Canadian government labs are collaborating with the US national labs on solutions like small modular nuclear reactors, carbon capture utilization and storage, bioenergy, hydrogen, smart grids, the application of artificial intelligence to energy, clean energy materials and advanced manufacturing, and energy systems in buildings and communities. So the one message that I hope you take away from my presentation today is this. 
when it comes to building an energy future that is cleaner, more inclusive, affordable, and secure, Canada and the United States will be able to do it better if we do it together. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew. So I would just encourage you to go to uh, the uh, Canada's booth uh, to meet with Andrew and his colleagues because it's very interesting in terms of how they too, as a major energy producer, are looking at all of the kinds of energy and how to really lower that carbon footprint in an integrated, forward-looking way. And I'm certainly glad to see what's happening with regard to all of the in indigenous work, but in also the inclusivity of, of everyone, including everybody being represented in that energy force moving forward. Uh, so now we're going to turn to Thomas Vallone, who is the president of the Integrity Research Institute. Thank you, Carol. Glad to be here. And if you have your uh, trifolds, um, some of them were hand handed out and others are up in the front. And also, uh, we gave you a preprint two pager of a 20 page journal article that's being published in the Journal of Earth Science and Climatic Change. I'm uh, happy to describe what our institute is doing and also tell you the need for it. Basically, the climate condition that's been revealed at the end of last year by UNEP, um, NCA4, IPCC, and COP24, I believe, and our institute believes, has essentially deceived the public into a little bit of complacency. One and a half to two degrees C is achievable, we'll level things out, everyone's going to be happy, nothing will get too hot. Well, that's uh, far from the truth. Um, what you see on the uh, summary graph from the Stanford University, Carnegie Institute, uh, University of Washington, uh, very impressive places, even NOAA, um, uh, Dr. S uh, Salman just down the street here, and also Scott Wing from Smithsonian, uh, have all described the five to six degree change that we're uh, indebted for by the end of 2100, by the beginning, in other words, the end of the century, 80 years from now. And essentially, we're looking at one degree every 20 years. In other words, we've already seen the Jim Hansen prediction from 1988 come true for 2019, and that was a full degree C to be uh, experienced worldwide. And unfortunately, we're adding so much carbon dioxide to the atmosphere from 290, which was the pre-industrial level, parts per million, up to 410 currently, which is 120 uh, parts per million that's been added. Well, Jim Hansen found through his 400,000-year uh, uh, analysis of, of the Vostok ice core, and essentially we're uh, able to correlate the CO2 level increase from 290 to temperature. And the reason I pause is that it's shocking because you end up with 20 parts per million equaling one degree C increase. And as I said, 120 has already been added to the 290. You do the math, divide by 20, you have six degrees. So this is our motivation for doing something extreme and not just uh, the standard uh, renewables that we think will solve the problem. Essentially, the first thing we need to address, and that's what our institute is working on, even with our uh, upcoming conferences, we've done 10 conferences on future energy so far. The first one I was fired from the patent office uh, for trying to have it at the State Department and then the Commerce Department. It took me six years of arbitration to get the job back. But this is the re resistance that people have to uh, outside-the-box energy solutions. And what's interesting, too, is that as we approach the uh, extreme possibilities of sequestering and ca capturing billions of tons of carbon from the atmosphere, not just preventing the emissions of carbon, which is a wonderful, laudable idea because we have to reach that stage where we're no longer emitting and the trend of the uh, increase in carbon emissions actually stabilizes and starts to go down, much like population has back in 1975. When I was born, there were three billion people in the world. It's already doubled to six billion. By the, uh, another 20 years, it'll be nine billion. So in my lifetime, population has tripled. Guess what? Carbon emissions are going to triple as well by the end of the century. Now, do you think the two are correlated? Of course they are. 
And so what we're talking about is the same trend that we see now in the rate of population growth has gone down since 1975, but the level keeps increasing until at least the near the end of the century, 2050 or so, where it might level out. Carbon dioxide is going to do the same thing. And this is, the, this is the shocking truth. In other words, Dr. Solomon from NOAA calls it irreversible climate change. I don't like to use that word, that's her phrase, but it still is what anthropologists describe leading to hunger, poverty, social breakdown, and war. So now that I've told you all the bad news, uh, let's look at our trifold and talk about the good news of uh, solutions to this problem. And essentially our institute is devoted to three-prong attack on the world's uh, major uh, issues, and that is energy, propulsion, and bioenergetics. And by looking at renewable energy and also outside the box emerging energy technologies, we're seeing large scale possibilities, geothermal, uh, nuclear, um, the list is so extensive that that's why we have conferences every year and we have monthly future energy e-news that you can subscribe to for free. We've done it for over almost two decades now, all archived on our website, integrityresearchinstitute.org. And so we're a nonprofit uh, organization dedicated to researching scientific integrity in the areas of energy propulsion and bioenergetics. And as described in our um, uh, trifold, essentially we're looking for the past three decades fulfilling the mission of our um, uh, vol all volunteer staff in, in these three areas. And we've presented on national TV, met with legislators, published books, journals, and in fact, the DVD describing what I'm talking about completely is available up here at the table and also at our booth. And the uh, research department essentially has developed um, bioenergy devices and many projects that we've funded in the propulsion areas. Just for an example, uh, we have an aerospace engineer from Boeing who just retired at the right time and essentially revealed a proprietary invention, gyroscopic, it's called control moment gyro, and essentially has been used to keep the space station up in orbit for uh, over a decade. And now he's able to get, got permission to use it for a tabletop demo. And to provide electrical power directly to provide force means that fossil fuels won't be needed for transportation or for possibly even for rocket and uh, space travel. And so we're basically uh, not only holding conferences, but promoting clean fossil fuel uh, free developments. And our Integrity Research Institute envisions a future world where pollution is a thing of the past and abundant energy is generated on site for every home, business, and vehicle. And one of the other projects we're actually funding and cooperating with the uh, Canadian Hathaway Consultants in Toronto is uh, the Spiral Magnetic Motor Project. And it's kind of exciting because the uh, idea of using the magnetic gradient for power has basically never been realized except in electric motors. However, the magnetic gradient itself is a source of force just as the thermal gradient, voltage gradient, and gravity gradients are used uh, worldwide. So this is a new development that's now being um, uh, prototyped, and we look forward to the possibility of having electric cars that would have an onboard charger. Can you envision a future that will have every electric vehicle being charged as it drives and no need to go find a charging station to survive the next uh, 10, 20, 50 miles? So when you talk about um, energy, look at it as the same way that air and water have been. We've had free air and free water for a while. Um, why not free energy? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, and it uh, obviously this is all about looking at a whole variety of visions, technologies, as we all work to find what kinds of things really will work and how we can make things really change for the better. So we are now, for the last speaker in this panel, going to Jeremy Richardson, who is the Senior Energy Analyst with, for, with UCS, the Union of Concerned Scientists, and they're always very concerned. Jeremy. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Carol. Uh, Jeremy Richardson, as you said, and there is a lot to be concerned about, it turns out. But, um, 
Uh, I am not the, but one of our senior energy analysts, I should, should add. Um, I wanted to talk for a few minutes about one specific uh, and concrete thing uh, that could be done to start to address um, the climate problem, and that's a bill uh, that's been introduced uh, by Senator Udall and, and some of his uh, colleagues. Uh, I didn't pass them out, but I have up here on the table some um, uh, short three-page description of the bill if you want to pick it up on the way out. We also have some more copies out at our booth. Uh, as well as some additional uh, information about some of the modeling that we've done around the bill. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about it. I won't throw too many numbers at you uh, because if I were sitting in your shoes, I'd forget them all anyway. Um, but I just wanted to flag why this is a really interesting proposal and also uh, at the outset say that there uh, will be a House companion. We expect um, Representative Welsh um, to uh, offer one in the coming months. So if you're interested in this proposal, uh, stay tuned for that because uh, there will be a chance to, to uh, co-sponsor it uh, here on the House side. Uh, so what this bill does is it establishes a, a national renewable electricity standard um, that would uh, achieve more than 50 percent renewable energy by 2035. Um, and just to give you a little bit of context, we're at about 18 percent renewable energy uh, as, a, as a fraction of generation uh, in 2018, and that includes all sources, including um, hydropower. Um, so uh, we did some analysis around this, um, and we really think that, the, that this proposal uh, would help uh, boost the economy, would benefit consumers, and will put us on a pathway to um, decarbonizing the electricity sector by mid-century, which is what the science tells us we need to get to. So many of you may be familiar with an RES or an RPS. Um, what it does in general is it um, requires electric utilities and retail electricity suppliers to um, increase the, gradually increase the amount of renewable energy that they uh, provide uh, to consumers. Um, that uses a market-based approach um, that helps stimulate competition among different technologies. Um, and, uh, and projects and companies to provide the greatest amount of clean power um, for the lowest price. Um, and it's, it's sort of established as an ongoing uh, incentive to drive down costs. Um, this this uh, policy mechanism is currently in place in 29 states as well as here in DC. Um, and they have a proven track record of um, success in deploying renewables, um, creating jobs, and reducing emissions uh, for the last uh, 20 years. So this, nat this idea of establishing a national uh, RES would help ensure that the entire nation um, benefits from that, from accelerating um, clean energy development. Uh, so what we found is that a 50% by 2035 RES is both feasible and affordable and it will help the U.S. get on track to meeting its climate goals. Um, just to give you a little bit of a sense of where we've been, uh, on average over uh, the last uh, three to five years, um, Renewable energy has grown um, as a fraction of sales by about a percent per year. And so what this uh, proposal would do is actually double that, more than double that uh, through 2035. And we think that's aggressive and, and achievable. Um, and it's also consistent with what a lot of the leading states have done uh, recently in terms of uh, really setting ambitious goals um, for renewable energy. Uh, so. The, the one point that I want to make um, in terms of the policy design is that typically what an RES policy does is it establishes uh, you know, a set fraction of, of energy that must be uh, generated from renewable sources uh, by a date certain. Um, so 100% um, by 2050 or 30% by 2030. You know, the, the, usually it's like the final target. This bill is actually interesting because it um, it kind of takes a novel approach, and, and what uh, Senator Udall has proposed is that for every single um, electricity, uh, retail electricity uh, pr provider, um, it doesn't matter where you're starting, you just have to increase. And so it's, it sets, uh, it, the standard is that you have to increase by a certain percentage every year. And what we think that, uh, the idea behind that was that um, all states would have to get started. And so you take away this argument from folks, uh, from states and utilities that don't have a lot of renewables currently because they're only recently becoming economic in those places um, that, that say, well, we can't possibly get to that high of a level by the date that you're talking about. And so this sort of takes that away and says, 
it doesn't matter if you're starting from zero, you just have to start increasing. And it's consistent with, as I said, how nationally, how, um, you know, how, how renewables have been increasing over the, over in recent years. Um, and so the other thing to note is that most existing resources don't qualify for credits under this. So typically what an RV, RPS does is it sets up a crediting mechanism where you can either produce um, renewable energy yourself or you can buy a credit from, from somebody that has excess credits. Um, this actually really focuses in on new generation. And so the idea is to try to get um, everybody to invest in, in new renewables. So I'll just give you a couple numbers. I won't give you too many, but some of the key findings of our analysis, we did a um, comparable analysis of a 50% by 2035 RES and found that it would achieve about $374 billion in cumulative new capital investments from 2020 uh, through 2035. That's cumulative. Um, we'd see about a $34 billion uh, uh, cumulative net savings in consumer energy bills that includes both um, uh, electricity and natural gas. Uh, it's about 0.6% uh, savings. And then finally, a 46% um, reduction in power sector uh, carbon dioxide emissions by 2035. That's an annual number. Um, so as I said, there's more, we have more information about our modeling uh, that we did on this. Um, you can see our website. I think we have some copies at our uh, um, at our booth of some of the slides that we put together and uh, but but I guess I would just leave you with the idea that um, you know this is an aggressive but achievable policy um, it would put us uh, the US on on course for decarbonizing the power sector by mid-century um, and uh, it's important to note that we're going to need additional policies beyond that really to get us where we need to be um, and those are things like putting a price on carbon or, or uh, somehow limiting carbon emissions broadly in, in the economy, uh, stronger ener energy efficiency standards, uh, increased funding for clean energy R, D, and D, um, uh, and infrastructure investments, um, and also incentives for greater electrification of the transportation sector, um, the building sector, and the industry sector. Um, and you know, as as a as somebody who comes from West Virginia, from a coal mining family, I think talking about this, um, the impact of these of this transition on coal communities is really important. And thinking through what the policies are that um, can really benefit um, uh, those communities as well is a really important part of this whole package of policies that we need. So I'm happy to answer questions. I have some handouts, and uh, thanks again for having Great. me here. Thanks, Jay. So we have time for one question because we have one minute left. Uh, anybody have a question that you want to ask? Okay, if not, because, uh, all right, we'll take that. Wait for the microphone, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does that work? Okay. Um, so um, with the recommendations that we've heard, a lot of it was related to electrification. Uh, my question is, we didn't talk much about the gas sector, renewable gas sector. Is that something that you guys are kind of emphasizing, looking at what can be done to decarbonize the gas sector aside of getting rid of it? Is there, do you have policy recommendations in that sense? Um, I don't know whether anybody here wants to take it, but it will come up later today. And, and I'm happy to talk to you and refer you to people. But did anybody else yeah, really? I can address that. Okay, can you do it really sure. fast? Real okay. Sandy Labs. Sandy and Nasser Labs has had a project for uh, years now called Sunshine to Petrol. You can Google it. And it's uh, exciting because it combines CO2 plus water to provide uh, hydrocarbon uh, fuel. And there were just a bunch of articles out the other day about that. And, and biogas is about Right, and biogas, biogas, there's a lot happening in that. Happy to talk to you about that later and see booths and come back for other policy forms. Okay, so thank you all very, very much for being here for this session. We're gonna start the next one within just a couple minutes and I also encourage you to follow up with any of our speakers. Make sure you go visit all of those wonderful booths. Thanks for being here.